I'm Philip, and today I'd like to talk to you about what I learned from sockets. So, I work at Bloomberg. They forced me to put the slide up, but otherwise they're pretty cool. Check them out. So, what did I learn from sockets? I'll get straight to the point. The thing I learned that I want to talk to you about today is that select is a very powerful tool. The idea behind it is we want to start a bunch of operations and then for, wait for one or more of them to indicate some kind of activity, success, failure, or whatever. And then we will react based on what happened. I think this is a useful thing to have beyond just sockets. And we can implement it in C++ without any interaction from the kernel. Just a tool like select all by itself. Another thing that I learned is, uh, so lots of concurrent and asynchronous operations involve waiting. And there are different ways to wait. For example, blocking a thread is one way to wait. Invoking a callback or suspending a coroutine or running a receiver on some executor. I think the only place where the mechanism of how wait matters is select. If we can focus on select, then we can isolate that from the rest of our code. In the abstract from my talk, I raised some questions, like how can I get the first of several futures, or co-await the first of several awaitables, or select several senders? Well, I'm just going to answer those right away. The problem with select is that it requires some cooperation from the operation itself. And with std future, there's no way we can add that. So the std future we got in C++11, can't be done. Now, as for awaitables, it turns out that senders introduces a way to basically turn an awaitable into a sender. They're almost isomorphic. So if you have an awaitable, that would be the first step. And next, if you want to select from several senders, you should make them look like sockets. I'd like to be precise by what I mean here. So the executor's paper and unifex they have things like when all and when any. Now, when any, what that does is it takes several senders, waits until the first is ready, and discards the rest. That is not select. <coughs> select lets you wait for the first one or more. It does not discard the rest. After the select is done, you can choose to consume the results or not, or go back to waiting for more. So it's a different thing. So the point is it requires cooperation, and we're going to have a look at how that could be done. So here's the agenda. First thing is what I learned from sockets, which we just went over. And the next, if you don't have much experience with sockets or select or epoll or any of those, this is a good place. I'm going to try to give you the kind of introduction I wish I had when I was first exposed to this stuff. And then, once we see how it works in kind of Unix and Linux, we'll see how we can do a, the same kind of thing in just plain C++. And then at the end, if there's time, uh, maybe throw in some coroutines, receivers, lots of fun. So before we get to selecting sockets, we should look at file descriptors. Then we'll see how read and write works and why select is a useful thing. Then we'll look at sockets, and then we'll use them in a not blocking way. There will be some code. I'll try to go no faster than necessary. So to start with, let's look at files. In Unix, everything is a file. We open the file, we use it, then we close it. When we open the file, we get back an integer. That's a file descriptor. The integer is kind of like an index into a per process table of open things. Uh, but that's really all there is to it. To use it, we might want to read or write. Uh, the read and write are system calls. The protocol is, let's say, for reading. I pass in a buffer, I pass in the size, and I get back a number. That number tells me what happened. If the number is greater than zero, then that's the number of bytes that were placed into my buffer. If the number is equal to zero, then I have reached the end of file. And if a number is less than zero, then something else has happened. 
possibly an error. And write as a mirror image of read. I give it a buffer and a size. I get back a number. If a number is greater than zero, then that many bytes were written from my buffer. If a number is equal to zero, that could also mean end of file. On a file system, that might mean that it's out of space. Otherwise, something else has happened. Sockets are kind of like files. The setup is different. I don't open a file. I create a socket, and then I connect it to some other address. But afterwards, it's exactly the same. I can write, let's say, an HTTP request into a socket. It's going to the other end, over the network to the server. And then I read back the response. And when I'm done, I close it, just like a file. Now, the thing is, these are, by default, blocking operations. So that read call, that's going to block until it's able to write some bytes to, well, not the network exactly, to a buffer in the kernel for eventual transmission over the network. And the read, well, that's going to block until some bytes are received and placed into some buffer by the kernel. So I'm just going to wait here until something on the network happens. And uh, like there's a buffer. We don't own the buffer, the kernel owns this buffer. When I write something, it gets placed by the kernel into the send buffer. So when the write returns <coughs> to my application, these things aren't on the network yet. They have been just placed into this buffer in the kernel. And if this buffer is full, then the next write call will block until there is space in it. In the meantime, in the background, these bytes are getting sent over the network at whatever line rate. And they're not even removed from the buffer until the remote side, assuming this is TCP, until the remote side acknowledges receiving these bytes. Then I can write some more. <coughs> Similarly, when I try to do a read, I'm reading from this buffer the receive buffer. If it's empty, my read will block until such time as the other side sends me some bytes. And then when I read them, I consume them from this buffer. We are not mandated to have this behavior. We can opt into non-blocking mode by passing an extra flag when we open our socket. Now, what this means is the protocol is now different. When I try to read, if there's stuff in the buffer, I get some non-negative number. If the other side has closed the socket, I get a zero and the file. Otherwise, I get back negative one, and additionally, error no is set to E again to indicate that there isn't really an error, but there is also no data available for reading right now. I should come back later. So this gives us an option to do something else instead of just blocking. Well, what else can we do when we, are, when we can't read or write any data to a socket? Let's have another socket. I create a second socket. Suppose I'm interested in reading data from both. And by the way, if you have a question or comment, interrupt any time. That's totally fine. So I have these two sockets. I want to read from both of them without blocking. How can I do that? Any ideas? Well, I can uh, run a busy loop, read from one socket, read from the other socket. And, uh, well, that's problematic because I'm burning CPU. I now need to tune some kind of interval or waste lots of power. Uh, it's not a very nice thing to do in general. There are exceptions, but in general, I don't think it is. I can't really block on either of these sockets because, say, I block on socket one. In the meantime, there's data on socket two that I won't consume because I'm blocking socket one. We need something else. This is exactly the kind of problem that select solves. With select, what I can do is I can block on either socket. And it, after, it, after I get unblocked, it tells me which one has data. <coughs> and the way we do it is this. We create an FD set. And pretend that's just a, like, exactly like a C++ bit set of some amount. Each bit in this set corresponds to a file descriptor number. And I set the bits that correspond to the file descriptors I'm interested in. 
and then I call select. I pass in the address of my FD set, and that's an in-out argument. The semantics here are the select call will block until any of the file descriptors set indicate the kind of behavior, the kind of event I'm interested in. Here we have like four arguments. The last one is a timeout, it's null. The other three are in, out, error. I'm asking select, please block until any of these file descriptors have data available for input. Or if they have data available right now, then this call to select won't block at all. It'll return immediately. Once it has returned, I have to examine the set. Select will leave only those bits enabled that correspond to file descriptors that actually have data. All the rest will be clear. So if SOC is set, I can read from it. And if SOC2 is set, I can read from it. This works, but it has a number of problems. The biggest one, I think, is that this, uh, this FD set size, uh, that's a macro definition, it, it, it's fixed. Like conceptually, we can recompile the world with a different value, but it's a fixed number. So we can't really work with file descriptor numbers that are too large. I think 1,024 is a common limit. So there's a fix to that problem. It's called poll. Instead of having this bit set, poll just uses an array, one element per file descriptor. Otherwise, it's a very similar idea. I say what file descriptor I care about. I say what events I care about. Events is a bit mask. In this case, poll in means I want data to read. Our events is kind of like the out argument. Paul will set that to what events actually happened. So here, it's the same idea. Hey, Paul, block me until any of the file descriptors I care about show the kinds of events I care about. In this case, I want data to read. Or if they have data to read right now, return immediately. And then afterwards, just as for select, I can check our events for what happened and then act accordingly. This works. Now I'm not limited to small file descriptor numbers, and I can have any number of file descriptors in that array I care about. But that raises another problem. The thing with poll and select is, every time I make this call, I have to specify the entire set of file descriptors I care about. And when this number gets large, that becomes a problem. Every time I make the call, the kernel has to essentially subscribe my process to events for each of those file descriptors. And whenever the call is about to return, whenever any of the events happened, the kernel has to unsubscribe me from all the file descriptors where events didn't happen. Because when select returns, when poll returns, I'm not waiting on them anymore. Not until the next time I call select or poll. And as the number of sockets we want to work with grows, that becomes a bottleneck. Fortunately, there is a solution to that too. There are many, in fact. KQ is one, but the one I'm most familiar with is Linux's ePoll. Instead of passing in the entire set of file descriptors all at once, let's have the kernel remember them for us. ePoll create returns, well, a file descriptor. But this file descriptor is not a file, not a socket. It corresponds to a data structure in the kernel that stores the file descriptors I care about and which events I care about. It remembers them. It's like a map owned by the kernel. I can populate this map by calling ePoll CTL and I pass it different flags to say I want to add this file descriptor with such events and this other file descriptor with different events, or maybe remove a file descriptor from this set, or maybe change which events I care about. So I can do that. I can create this data structure in the kernel, populate it with the file descriptors I want to wait for, and then I call ePoll wait. 
that semantics are exactly the same. Put me to sleep until any of the file descriptors I told you I care about indicate any of the events I told you I'm interested in, but I don't have to pass them in here. They persist. And then this function, it returns when any of the events have happened or if they are already the case immediately. Then I can examine the event data structure passed in for which thing happened on what file descriptor, and I can react accordingly. This here is very, very powerful. And I think we, we can stand to benefit from it in more contexts. One practical example of when such a thing is super powerful is, uh, uh, well, establishing connections. I'm going to get to that. But basically, this has been a demonstration of uh, what I have seen called the Unix readiness model, or synchronous concurrency. The idea is I have a bunch of operations which are atomic, non-blocking. I can just do them, but they might fail. And they have this one thing, select or poll or epoll, which I then use to do all my waiting. Wait for anything. And then I react, do some more stuff, and repeat. And then close the stuff. So as an example, let's suppose I am a web browser. I want to establish a connection to some website, say Microsoft.com. I pick this totally randomly. So that's not a, an address to which I can connect, it's a, a name. We have to map this name to an address. You can use DNS for that. Hey, DNS server, what's Microsoft.com? It gives me back an actual address. And then we can use this to connect to a server at that address. We do the three-way handshake with TCP. Connection is established. Unfortunately, in reality, it doesn't work like this. It's a little bit more complicated. What happens, really, when I ask the DNS server from Microsoft.com, it gives me back potentially more than one address. Now, why this is done, it doesn't really matter. Maybe mirroring or caching or proxies or whatever. The point is, I should be able to connect to any of these addresses to reach Microsoft.com. So what do I do? A naive approach that I have actually tried in the past is to just try them in turn. Connect to the first one. If that times out, connect to the second one. That times out, connect to the third one. That's not very good. TCP timeouts by default are quite long. We don't want to wait that long if the second address would have succeeded right away. Another approach is, yeah, well, we can connect to all of them in parallel. That's a little wasteful, too. We really just need one connection. Establishing two or four or however many and then throwing away all but one, not so great. Fortunately, there is an answer to this problem, too. There is a specification called Happy Eyeballs. Yeah, and it describes, really briefly, how to go about establishing a working connection quickly in this case. And the idea is, try connecting to a first address, and then wait a bit. If some short amount of time elapses, a few hundred milliseconds, try connecting to the second address. Now, the first connection is still pending. It's still trying to be established. We just started the second one, too. And then, supposing the second one succeeds, that's the one we're going to use, and it will also be a good citizen and uh, cancel the first one. And the, the outcome of this is, uh, you know, the first address doesn't work. We don't waste too much time, time trying the second one. But if the first address does work, we don't open too many unnecessary connections. It's kind of elegant. And we've got our connection working. So we can do this. Like, ePoll is perfectly suited to this kind of thing. So let's, let's just write it. I, I can do it for you in Slideware. It doesn't take that much. So if, let's say I have a function. Here is a bunch of addresses. Connect to one of them and return that. So we do some setup. And by the way, unique FD, unique pointer, it's the same thing. Instead of deleting a pointer, it closes the file descriptor. So we create an ePoll object. We're going to start a loop. 
for every address given, we're going to do something. And then once we have exhausted all the addresses, we're going to wait until all the connections fail or one of them succeeds. Let's look at the details. For each address given, I will create a socket, a non-blocking socket. I will then connect to the address specified. Because the socket is non-blocking, this connect call is, doesn't block either. To know whether or not I have actually connected, I have to use select or poll or epoll. And the protocol is, the socket will indicate that it is ready for writing when it has established a connection, or it will indicate an er error otherwise. So I will add it to my epoll object using the uh, epoll out, epoll out, or epoll hub. Let me know if either of the socket is ready for writing or it has hung up, disconnected. Then I will wait. Epoll wait blocks my thread until either any of the file descriptors I have added so far indicates readiness or this many milliseconds have elapsed. And then it returns to me the number of events that have occurred, zero or one in this case. Then yeah, I react based on what happened. <laughs> if no events have occurred in the time specified, count to zero, start the next connection, continue to the next iteration of a loop. Otherwise, let's have a look at what happened. If events are equal out, the socket is ready, I, I return it and I'm done. Otherwise, the socket has encountered an error, I erase it from my set and I remove it from the equal object. Next iteration of a loop, do the same thing again. Once I have uh, started all of the addresses, I need to wait for all of the outstanding connections to complete. It's the same thing, more or less. Wait for events. In this case, the timeout is minus one. Minus one means no timeout. Block potentially forever until some event happens. And the react is exactly the same. In fact, we can kind of split these into little pieces. Wait, wait for an event, returns an optional event. React, given an event, either return a connected socket if it was a success or not, and erase it from all the necessary things. That's the structure. Just try establishing connections with some interval between them, and if I haven't succeeded yet, wait for any open connections to complete. That's it. Demo time. <coughs> So I can view connect one.cpp, and here we have that's for function. Wait returns zero or one events. React handles the event, either returning a connected socket or erasing it from the set. Then for each address provided, I open that connection. Wait for some amount of time, and if I get back a connected file descriptor, I'm done. Then exhaust all my open connections, and then that's it. It fails. And if I'm very lucky and my internet still works, I can actually run this. Uh, let's see. So ninja. So that compiles. One, uh, let's see. Anybody want to try a particular URL? It doesn't really matter. Microsoft.com, HTTPS. So see, yeah, that went pretty fast. It established the connection. So <coughs> Microsoft.com actually has a bunch of IPs, which is why I picked it primarily. And it happened to connect to that one. By chance, it'll sometimes connect to different ones. Now, back to the code. So the thing about this function is uh, it runs to completion. It, it's going to block the calling thread until it's able to produce a file descriptor or fail. But if I'm a web browser, that's not a very good behavior. What happens if 
the user changes their mind. They open the tab, or typed in whatever, and while I'm trying to establish this connection, they decide, close the tab. They no longer care. Well, as written, uh, that function can't really be interrupted in the cleanly. I can kill the program, but that's not, it doesn't go. So, sockets actually help us fix this problem too. This version of connect, instead of returning the connection, writes it to an output socket. Yeah. So, in Unix, Unix domain sockets has, have this nice ability where it is possible to send a file descriptor over a socket to maybe another program. The details are a little bit uh, unfortunate, unfortunately awkward, but suffice it to say that the possibility is there. So what this function does is either writes a connected file descriptor to the output socket or doesn't in case of failure. And the this is going to give us cancellation very naturally. The setup is mostly the same, except in addition to all of the connections I will open, <coughs> I am also interested in whether my output file descriptor has been closed. Hang up. So now, anytime I do an epoll wait call and the output gets closed, I will wake up immediately and know. That's the only change in the React function. So instead of returning the file descriptor, it returns a bool, which says, am I done yet? If the event being handled tells us that the output has been closed, then I'm done. There's nothing for me to do. Otherwise, it's a connection I am trying to establish. If that connection is writable, it's established, I send it to my output. Otherwise, it has failed, I will erase it from the set and say, false, I'm not done. So, it's the same code, more or less. For each address given, create the socket, start the connection, wait for some amount of time. Handle that event. If that event tells us we're done, either by establishing the connection or the output being closed, we're done. Otherwise, keep going, at the end, exhaust all the connection attempts. That's it. Demo time. So we can look at connect2. And here it is. Connect2 takes the addresses, the output. I subscribe to the output being hung up. And this was a short thing. It's a little macro for error checking. Ignore it. Weight is exactly the same, and React exactly as I said. If, if it's the output being shut, I'm done. Otherwise, if it's a connection being successfully established, send it to the output and I'm done. Otherwise, erase it from the set and continue. And we can do this too. Let's see. And I can do connect to microsoft.com, HTTPS. And that's going to work, uh, but it's too fast. Uh, I don't, I won't be able to interrupt this in time. So let's do uh, sudo delay. And that's just, uh, that's just a little script that installs a, a, a packet filter to delay packets artificially. So now, if I try the same thing again, it's going to take a little longer, right? And if I run it a few times, it will, with some probability, pick a different IP address. But if I interrupt it, see, I, I interrupted it using Control C. I did not kill the process because. because I didn't scroll down far enough and show you the interesting bit. Over here, I use signal FD, which is kind of like a socket, except uh, it's for signals. It lets me do select or poll or epoll until my process gets a signal. 
Then I start a thread that does the uh, does the connect attempt, and then over here I start a thread. I open the Unix domain socket for the thread to produce me the output, and over here I wait until either the connect thread has established the connection, or until an interrupt uh, a signal happens, in which case I close the output socket and that thread detects that and just naturally quits. Very nice. This, is, this has been very useful, especially at work where just cancellation happens naturally. When any process gets told, hey, I don't care about your output, it just bails out. It works. But this has been done using uh, you know, sockets and the kernel. What I want to show you is that we can do this in C++ all by ourselves. So imagine this. The right handle, that's not necessarily a socket, although it could be. That's an abstraction, some place where I can write FD handle. FD handle is like unique FD, but also an abstraction for some file descriptor. Select is a C++ object. The kernel is not involved here. This is a pure C++ class. But I get to use it like epoll. It is the same kind of thing. It is a thing that remembers what kinds of events for what entities I'm interested in. I tell it, insert, out. I'm interested in events for that entity. Modify out, hub. I am interested in that entity being hung up or closed. And I have a timer. Insert. I am interested in events for this timer. Modify. Events in. For a timer, which is really a timer FD, which is again kind of like a socket, which can be select or poll or epoll, it indicates readiness when the time has elapsed. So I'm interested in this timer having elapsed. When I build my set of connections, for each of the connection, I will do the same thing. I will create it, start the connection, insert it into the set, indicate my interest, wait for events for some amount of time, and then when I react, based on what happened, I will do different things and return whether I should continue or stop. If the event says my timer elapsed, that just means it's time to establish the next connection. I am not done yet, return false. If the handle is out, that tells me that the place where I would have put my result is now shut. Nobody cares about my output anymore. I'm done, return true. Otherwise, the entity is one of the connections. Is this connection established? Is the event out. Yes, it is. I send it off to the output and I'm done. Return true. Otherwise, the connection failed. Erase it. Return false. And the structure of the function is exactly the same. For each address given, establish it, start the connection, <coughs> wait, and react. Once I'm out of addresses, no more timer. I'm waiting until they're all failed or one of them succeeds. But select that wait. It looks like that call blocks a calling thread, but it doesn't need to. This is just a C++ class. Inside of it, I can have a condition variable that gets notified when something happens, or I can have a coroutine that gets resumed when something happens, or I can have a sender that triggers some receiver when something happens. We have complete control here. And by customizing just this one piece, we get to control how we wait, totally separate from what it is that we're waiting for. So next, I hope to show you how this can work. This is just my ideas. Uh, but before that, let's talk about pipes. Just a simple conceptual model to make our starting point. So in Unix, a pipe is just a pair of file descriptors. That's a system call, it populates that array. 
One of the file descriptors is for writing. I can write bytes there. The other one is for reading. The bytes I wrote come out on the reading side. Under the hood, we can imagine that these two file descriptors refer to the same kernel object, file description. And here it just holds a buffer with the data. So let's use this as our conceptual model to build a C++ object that behaves in more or less the same way. We can have a read handle and a write handle. They refer to some shared state where it holds the data. And right now, buffer, null opt, that's an optional. It's one, one char. But it's the rest of the stuff that's, that's more interesting, it's not just the data transfer itself. We'll need these things. It is shut. Has this thing been shut yet from either side? Mutex, because this is multi-threaded potentially, so we have to be careful. And critically, number of readers and number of writers. The reason why we need to do that is for either end to know when nobody else is on the other end. Well, a little bit more terminology. When we're doing sockets or pipes, the protocol, the return value is an int. Uh, one, I have read one byte. Zero, I have reached the end of file. Minus one, there is no data to read or no space in the buffer to write. I have to try again later. But let's, let's use a variant for that and some tag types to distinguish. Success, I got the data. Or successive void, I wrote. And the file. Or woodblock. They're empty tag types. So that's the code. This is real code. It really works like that. This is going to be our protocol, but more or less maps directly to how sockets work. So suppose I have a right handle. I try to write a char. First time I do that, I get back success, void. I wrote A, great. I try to do that again, I get back wood block. There is no space in the buffer right now. Try again later. If I read, first time around, I get back the A, and now my buffer is empty again. I try to read again, I get back wood block. There is no data in the buffer. There can be more than one reader or writer. That's why we need to keep track of how many there are. And the reason why that's important is once we end the file, well, that's when either this thing gets shut or when the last writer lets go of, their, of the right handle. Or if a reader is shut, shuts this or when the last reader lets go of their file uh, read handle. So when all the writers go away, we implicitly shut the thing. Just like in Unix and Linux, uh, pipes are shareable across processes and the last process to close their file descriptor that implicitly shuts the pipe. So when there are no more readers, I try to do a write and a file. So we can use this, right now it's just a plain non-blocking, not, not future exactly, but kind of like that. I can just push bytes in one end, pull bytes out the other end, and if there's no more room to push, would block, but it doesn't block. It just tells me that it would have. If there's no more data to write, it would block. It doesn't block, it just tells me it would have. So imagine I want to build up a little pipeline of chars and here's a little piece of that pipeline that just capitalizes all the chars. We can do that using these things. So we get a read handle for the input, write handle for the output. Let's try to read. If there's no more data, we're done. But if it would have blocked, I need to busy wait until there's data. Once I have a char, I capitalize it, then I want to write it. If it's in the file, I, nobody cares about my output, I'm done. Otherwise, I have to busy wait. Busy wait on the read, busy wait on the write. This works, not efficiently, but it works. We're going to come back to this function later. Now, uh, the read handles and the right handles. These are just the shared pointers to the shared state. They have a read and a write function that return the result. The shared state, it has exactly what I showed. It has the buffer, the, the shut, and uh, 
it keeps track of a number of readers and writers. Their constructors follow the rule of six to keep a number of references correct. I can't really reuse the shared pointer use count here because the readers and the writers own the same shared pointer. But I need to know how many readers or writers there are. And uh, to read, again, simple non-blocking read. If there's data right now, pull it out. If there's, if there's no data and we're shut, end the file. Otherwise, it would block. Writers, if it's shut, and the file, if the buffer is full, it would block. Otherwise, put the data in. Very straightforward. And shut, for now, this is a very boring function. It just sets a bool. Later, it will be much less boring. <coughs> so now, we can talk about the select object. Remember that the select, its job is to remember which things we care about, what entities we are interested in, and which events for each entity are we interested in. So each thread, each caller, let's say, could have a select object with a whole bunch of entities in it. In the meantime, each entity, like our pipe, could have more multiple selects interested in its events. This is a kind of many-to-many -many relationship. It's like that. Each caller is interested in a bunch of shared states. Each shared state has a bunch of callers interested in it. And the select object is what owns that relationship. The responsibilities are kind of like this. Each shared state, pipe in our case, we have to tell it who is interested in what, subscribe or unsubscribe. And it has to tell the select object, hey, something has happened, here it is. Notify of events. And each caller, they have this kind of protocol with a select object. They have to insert or erase the entities they care about, modify which events they care about for each entity, and then wait until any of those events happened. When the shared state notifies select, select has to wake the caller. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship, and one way to do that is to have a kind of map in select and a multi-map in shared state. For example, from which events a heading cares about to the thing that cares about it. In my opinion, it's kind of tough to keep these two in sync. So instead, I turn to intrusive containers. Each select has an owning set of links, one link per entity it cares about. In the meantime, each shared state has a non-owning, intrusive, doubly linked list of the links currently interested in any of the events for that entity. Yeah, I love intrusive containers, they're the best. And the ideas I want to cover next are uh, fairly similar to what John talked about in this uh, talk a while ago now, about channels. We're kind of coming at it from different directions, and we're going to go to different places, but for a piece of a path, we're going to share a road. So, yeah, remember, the job of select is to subscribe all the links to their corresponding shared state. The job of shared state is to notify all subscribed links of their corresponding events. So those are the two things, subscribe and notify. And how it might work is uh, the shared state, it has a, an intrusive, non-owning, doubly linked list of links. The empty list actually points to itself. It's, this isn't too important, but it makes a lot of the implementation very elegant. If you look at the list implementation in uh, libstdc++, it's like this. In uh, boost, a lot of stuff is like this, very useful. So by default, it's empty, it just points to itself, there are no links. When I subscribe a link to a shared state, I splice it into the list. And there can be more than one. But each of these links is owned by a different select object. Each of which might also own other links that are potentially subscribed to other shared states. This is a many-to-many -many relationship. So in order to uphold 
the notify side of the agreement, the shared state must now do more. This is where the cooperation comes in. We can't really have a select or something like it without cooperation from the entities involved. They have to do something. And that is, when something has happened, they have to tell us. So now, when we do a read, we will instantiate this notify object. Notify is just a simple RAII class that, on the way out of this function when we return, it goes and pokes all the links that were interested in the event. So, I'm about to do a read. If there was data in the buffer, I'm going to take a data out, which means any interested writers should be told that they can now write. So I say, hey, links, extract anybody <coughs> interested in events out and put them in this notify object, return success, the destructor wakes them all up. When I want to write, if the buffer was empty, that means I'm going to put something there. And any readers should now be told that you have data to read. So I say, hey, links, extract all the, all the interested parties who care about input and put them in this notify object. Put the data in, return, and this notify in its destructor wakes them all up. And shut, this is what shut now does. Flip the bool, and hey links, extract anybody who is interested in hangups. And on the way out of this function, I'm going to wake them up. This is a, an important thing here is that I do that after I release the mutex. It, it has to be that way because the things waking up might want to go back in and touch the and do more stuff, maybe subscribe to a different set of events, maybe actually do a read or write. So I can't be holding the mutex in this thread while I'm notifying the links. So now let's look at subscribe. The key point in subscribe is given a link that is interested in some events, I first check, is anything that this link is interested in, is it ready to go now? For example, if you're interested in data, and do I have data in my buffer now? If I do, I will tell you right away. I won't actually subscribe you or remember this link at all. I'll just say, here, it's ready, and return false. Or if you're interested in writing and I have space in my buffer, or if you're interested in shutdown and it's already shut down, this will not actually subscribe the link. It will just fast path out and return false. False means I did not subscribe the link because the events have already happened. Otherwise, I save it in my list, my non-owning intrusive link list, and return true. I subscribe this link. I promise to wake it up when any of the events happened and it has not been unsubscribed yet. Similarly, unsubscribe, eh, ramp lock, eh, if the link happens to be not subscribed at all, which might happen for a bunch of reasons, which I'll get into later, uh, I return false. The semantics here are, try to unsubscribe this link. If you can't, for whatever reason, return false, otherwise return true. And the reasons are, it's not subscribed at all, or it was subscribed, but a different thread is in the process of notifying this link. And that, that kind of takes care of the shared state's responsibilities here. <coughs> Next, let's look at select. Select is a very close analog of epoll. When I create a view object, that's like creating an epoll object. When I insert a handle, it's like adding a file descriptor. When I modify it, that's a modify. Wait is a blocking call, and then I can also erase stuff to say I no longer care about events for this file descriptor, nor will I. So here's select. It has the owning set of links. That's where we live. That, that's an STD set. It's responsible for actually freeing the memory. It also has a few intrusive non-owning link lists, which I will demonstrate their usage shortly, and the mutex and the convar for thread safety. So now here's a 
<clears throat> Let's imagine the lifetime of a link. Suppose I have some shared state and a select object that is just initially default constructed empty. It does not care about anything yet. The first thing I do is I insert a link for a particular entity that creates the link object associated with that shared state and the select, inserts it into the set. That's it. Nothing else happened yet. Next, I modify. I tell the select object which events I care about for this particular entity. That sets the events field on the link and also inserts it into the to subscribe list. I don't subscribe right away. I just insert it into a list of links to subscribe next. That happens when I wait. What wait does, first, well, in this case, there's nothing else happening, and I'm not subscribed to anything yet, so it looks at the to subscribe list, picks the first link off, and calls subscribe on the corresponding shared state. That function right now returns false because nothing's happening yet. So now I have subscribed. I know this link is waiting for events. The wait call blocks. In the meantime, some other thread writes some value to the shared state. Remember that write pops the link off the shared states list and adds it to the notify object that is a local in that thread. Then that notify object in its destructor tells this link, hey, something has happened, wake up. What that does is it moves the link onto the notified list in the select object. And that's where all the notified links live. When events happen while the owner of select is not in a blocked wait call, all the links accumulate in the notified list. Then the convar is notified, it checks the notified list, sees I have a link with events that are ready. It returns with those events and then puts the link back on to subscribe. So that the next time I wait, this thing gets subscribed again. Now, if I modify events during the state to yeah. no events, that's saying, for now, I do not care about events from that entity. I might later, but right now I don't. That removes it from whatever linked list it is currently inside of. And in this case, since uh, we were in to so subscribe, uh, that's pretty straightforward. Because the shared state right now does not have any references to this link. Finally, when I erase it, poof, gone. So let's look at the implementation of select. Apologies for the typos. Insert is easy. I'm creating a new relationship between the select object and some entity. Wait is also kind of easy. Grab a lock, check if there are any notified links with ready events. And if there are, return the first one. Otherwise, Iterate over all the links in the to subscribe list. For each link, try to subscribe it to its corresponding handle. If that function returns uh, false, that's telling us that the events are ready now. So you don't actually need to block at all. Just move it right back to to subscribe and return the result. Otherwise, wait until the condition variable for any of the notify objects to let us know that something has happened in the loop forever, until something happens. Now, erase and modify are both slightly challenging for the same reasons, which is what is happening, what should happen if I try to erase or modify a link while a different thread is in the middle of notifying it? That's what this unlink function is for. And modify is the same. Modify is going to change the set of events that this link cares about. So first I have to make sure that it is not currently being notified. And once that's done, 
I can either uh, put it back in the to subscribe list or remove it from any list at all if it's being disabled. So now this unlink function. First, I try to ask the handle, the entity, hey, can you unsubscribe this thing for me? It'll answer yes or no. If it answers yes, then it was not in the middle of being notified and I'm done. If it answers no, then my link was in the middle of being notified by another thread. I have to wait until they're done, which I can do. See, this, this middle while loop, waiting under condition variables to be notified, it looks like it's a blocking call, but this call is guaranteed to never block for very long, certainly not on any external events or anything of the sort. It will only block until the notify object in the other thread gets around to notifying this link. And that's always, that's a non-blocking operation. It's always fast. It's guaranteed to happen in finite time. And that's it. That's the complicated part. Finally, extract. This is the function responsible for picking out the links that are inter interested in a particular event and putting them into the notify object. And finally, notify for every link in its internal list. Clear flags. This is what's telling the other thread, I'm no longer notifying this link. Then put it on the select objects notified list and poke the condition variable. That's it. So now, remember this function from before. Capitalize the input by busy waiting. We don't need to busy wait anymore. We can now use a select object. So let's have a setup. We create our select, we insert in and out, and then we start a loop. First, we care about reading. So modify input to tell me if it is either has data to read or has been shut. But also, I want to know if my output has been shut. Let's wait until any of those things occur. Select that wait. Then, if my output has been shut, I'm done. Bail out. Otherwise, if my input has been shut, if it doesn't have data to consume, I'm also done. Then, I, I read. And this function here is guaranteed to not block because I was just told that there's data. Next, let's set up a write. While I'm writing, I don't actually care about the input at all. There might be more, more data, it might have been shut, I don't care right now. But for output, I want to know, can I write or is it shut? Wait for the event. If the output has been shut, I'm done. Otherwise, write the next character and do that on a loop. That's it. No more busy waiting. Our function no longer burns CPU, and furthermore, unlike the earlier busy wait version, if the output gets shut prematurely, it will just naturally detect that and return. Very nice, I think. Uh, and uh, we can expand this. Like, the version I showed you so far, the read and the write, they dealt in single characters at a time. Well, really, they could be templates that deal in any single value at a time. They don't have to. They can deal in buffers. Like, let's say I want to read into a span of mutable characters. And I return not the value I read, but how many. Or I want to write from a span of immutable characters. And I return not a successive void, but how many I wrote. This interface maps very directly to actual sockets. And uh, I, like I, at work, I have something very much like this. It has been extremely convenient to have a common interface for uh, like operating system primitives like sockets or pipes and in-memory pure C++ objects, like, like not promise in the future, but kind of, like channels. And now, looks like I do have time to talk about senders and receivers. 
Uh, there are lots of good talks for, about senders receivers. This one by Eric Niebler. Uh, this other one from last year's CPPCon, a uh, very good talk. Uh, is that you, Lucien? I loved your talk, man, very nice. Uh, so yeah, senders are, like the idea with senders is uh, we have a sender and a receiver. A sender is just represents an operation that can happen and re report its results later somehow. A receiver is a thing that can consume those results. And we can compose stuff up by hooking those together. So suppose I have a sender of something. I can make that thing work in this context by changing the shared state to the operation state. So what we can do is uh, we can build up an operation state that combines the sender and receiver interface. Rather, it uses a custom receiver to hook up the sender interface to something that looks like a pipe or a socket. There's going to be some, something there to store the data. But when the operation completes, either with a success or error or cancellation, it doesn't consume the data, it just notifies the right waiter accordingly. So it can look something like this. The operation stays there, and the select object subscribes and unsubscribes like normal. When the receiver sees some result, that's like a write having happened in a different thread. It will notify any subscribed select. Or if the operation is canceled, that's like it closed or shut without any data being written. And finally, when I read or write, when I try to read, there's a buffer in there that holds the temporary data. And if it's not there, that, then that would have blocked. And if it is there, then it consumes the result. And close, close is the only one that needs a additional work. If a caller closes this thing, this operation state, without consuming the answer, that, is, that gets translated into a request to cancel the composed operation. So it's like that. And remember in here, inside the sender, there used to be this condition variable and the wait function would block the calling thread. That does not need to be the case. We can change this to do whatever we want. For example, we can make select a sender. So now, instead of, or rather, in addition to the condition variable, we will store a pointer to some operation state. And now the sender returns a handle. Yeah. The operation state holds a reference to the select and whatever receiver. And set value just invokes the receiver. Now run, all it has to do is just tell us that here's the operation state that you will be notifying for the next event that happens. Senders are one shot, so we kind of have to do this over and over again. Yeah, that's it. Not, not much code involved to make this work. The only change is in the notify. That used to notify the condition variable. Well, now it checks is there a receiver, or rather an operation state, currently waiting for events of the select? And if it is, I will go call set value. Otherwise, I will stash this event off in the list of ready events. And because, it, from my understanding of the sender talks, senders are isomorphic to awaitables, we can just do that. We can just uh, treat select as a sender or treat it as an awaitable, co-await, select, whatever. And that works. But it's the only piece that has to change when we want to do different kinds of waiting. And that's really what I learned from sockets. It's to split the code apart, do the setup using just plain old linear non-blocking code, then wait somehow,
for one of potentially several things and then react and do it in a loop. That is all. Thank you so much. My, my sample code, of which I didn't actually get to show you all of it, yeah. should eventually appear there once I clean it up and get it approved by Bloomberg. But that's all. Thank you.